Amen. Praise God. If you'll stand for the reading of God's word, um, what I will say is, um, as I have said before, that um, I love you all. <sighs> you sure y'all love me? Yeah. Amen. Um, and I'll say that before I say what I'm going to say, because there is something that is on my heart, um, especially as we are rounding the corner on um, the Resurrection Sunday, okay? So um, if it hurts a little bit, just say ouch and we'll keep moving. Or just, just say amen and holler loud, amen? That way nobody will know that we're talking about you, amen? Praise God. Um, in the book of Acts chapter 1, in the book of Acts chapter 1, we are rounding the corner on Easter or Resurrection Sunday. Um, I'm thankful for all of the words and the encouragement that we've gotten over the past few weeks. Um, it's our holiday. It's our celebration. It's, it's a Christian theme that runs throughout every church. As far as I'm concerned, there's nothing else to preach but Jesus Christ, him crucified, uh, buried, and then he rose from the dead. Amen. That's the greatest story ever told, and I don't care of all the other agendas that are out there, the thing that is most important to me um, and for our church is that way we remember, we remember the cross, we remember what he died on the cross for, and we remember most importantly that he rose from the dead. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, I'm a believer. Come on, find another neighbor, look at him and tell him, say, neighbor, I'm a believer. In the book of Acts, chapter 1, we are going to talk about things pertaining to the kingdom. The Bible says over in Acts, chapter 1, I'll start in verse, well, I'll start at the beginning. How about that? In verse 1, it says, The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to both do and teach. Now, again, we're in Acts, so he had already died and rose again. But then he reappears to them. And Luke, who is the author of this, this act, the book of Acts, begins to write and pen some of the things that have taken place. And he says in verse 2, until the day in which he was taken up, after that, after that, he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he had showed himself alive after his passion, by many infallible proofs. Somebody say infallible proofs. Amen. We'll come back to that in just a minute. Being seen of them 40 days and speaking, look at this, and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but that they should what? Wait for the promise of the Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah which he saith, ye have heard of me. Verse 5 says, For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And when, and when they, therefore, were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will you at this time again restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. Hallelujah. Verse 8. But ye shall receive what? And then after that, the Holy Ghost, which has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses um, both unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in San Angelo and Samaria and into the uttermost parts of the earth. Amen? And he concludes with verse 9 and says, And when he has spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up in a cloud, and a cloud received them out of their sight. God bless you. You may have your seats. There is so much in this particular passage of scripture that it bears repeating again and again and again because it wasn't just for them. It is for us today. The background on this is, of course, that it's about 40 days after his resurrection. And now it's time for his departure. Jesus begins to give his uh, apostles, or flip, if you'll flip back to verse 2, it says those who he had given by way of the Holy Ghost, given commandments unto the apostles whom he chosen. 
And so this scripture tells us that many things, go back, many things that after this, by way of the Holy Ghost, somebody say Holy Ghost. Okay, some people like to say Holy Spirit because we don't want to spook anybody. So you can say Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost. Either way, same, same. He said he had given by way of the Holy Ghost. He had given them commandments, commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. So this was going to be a select group of people who he was going to surround himself by. Verse 3 says that he's going to give himself, show himself alive, okay? In other words, handle me, see me, put your, put your finger in my hand, put your hand in my side. Uh, I'm going to eat with you. I'm going to talk with you by many infallible proofs. The Greek word on that is tekmiera, which means pure and clear indications, undeniable truths. Last week, I told you about the O.J. Simpson case. If the hands, if it, if it doesn't fit, you must acquit. Remember that? And so um, these were infallible proofs beyond the shadow of any doubt, amen, that Jesus actually is who he said he would be, amen. The resurrected Lord, the Messiah who has come the one who was going to restore all things back to its rightful order for us to be able to be kingdom citizens, amen. And it says, in being seen of them 40 days and speaking to them of things, say this with me, and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God, amen. After the resurrection, the disciples are there. There's many followers now, there's many believers now. They are all in unfamiliar territory. This was going to be a time where there would be no more sermons, no more parables, no more miracles, no more challenges from the Pharisees. Y'all with me? There's nothing else to prove. There's no more cross. Matter of fact, I took it down. I prayed. Amen. I came in here. I took the cross down. It was right here with all of your issues. Took them down. Prayed over them and buried. They're all gone. Turn to neighbor and say, neighbor, they're gone. All of them are gone. Amen. So all the things that we nailed down, I left it up there for two weeks. Why? I give you an opportunity that if you wanted to take your issues down off the cross and put them back into your life, you had the freedom to do it. But nobody came back in here. I took it down, prayed over it, took the cross out. Amen. And now, all, now it's up to us to walk in that which God has already promised us. Hallelujah. And he says he's going to speak to them about the kingdom. Amen. It is finished. Hallelujah. And now it is time for us to do and to teach that which was shown unto them by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Don't you wish you were there? The doctrines had already been taught. Kingdom principles had already been taught. The miracles, look, no more miracles from Jesus. He's gone. But the best ministers, the best believers are those who do and teach. Those whose lives are a, a constant sermon that even when we walk in H-E-B, we are a living testimony and a witness of what we believe. Hallelujah. The infallible proof whether or not that cross had the ability to hold his life or Jesus, would you, is life greater than death. And the infallible proof is sitting right in front of you. Hallelujah. He walked with them, talked with them, ate with them, showed them, taught them, gave them, walked with the men for me, mayors, walked, gave them commissions, and then he sits them down. Are you ready? He sits them down in a private setting and talks to them about things pertaining to the kingdom. The Bible is almost not fair because it does not express exactly what he told them. All he did was tell them, you wait. Mm. You wait. Go back to Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Father over in verse 4. You've heard me talk about it. He says, and the example that I gave you is that John is going to baptize in water, but I'm coming to baptize you at the Holy Ghost not many days hence. You just have to wait. Now, the reality is that Pentecost is about 35 days away. So you've got about 35 days from now before the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is going to take place. There is something that we need to do between the resurrection and Pentecost. 
there is a work that we have to do. And Jesus said, you got to wait. You got to go in there and you got to pursue God with everything you have. Don't go traveling here. Don't go do this. Don't go do this. I want you all to go to Jerusalem. Amen. Go to the city of David. And I want you to wait there. Not just wait there and go wait. Lord, when are you going to show up? When are you going to show up? No, wait there. Pursue him. Pursue him. Go after him. Seek him. Invite everybody else to come because when, the, when it happens, he said it is the promise. Somebody say promise. If God promised that he is also able to perform that which he said is going to happen. So the reality is that if we just go into the church, hallelujah, these are the days where if nothing else, we should be pursuing God like never before because there is an act that is going to take place. There is a dynamic that is going to take place in the body of Christ and it will be the outpouring of the Holy Spirit like never before and we will see how men will dream dreams and, and visions and miracles and signs and prophecies and there was a great work to be done in the body of Christ y'all gonna hear me today just as there are things taking place inside there are greater things taking place outside that's why I brought Tony here to show you that there was a great need yes we need youth workers but we also need people on the outside of the church who have a heart and a passion to do the things of God like never before it's an exciting time amen as Charles Dickens said, it is the worst of times and it is the best of times at the same time. The kingdom is needing the church to respond. And the church needs to recognize that there is a greater value of what God has placed inside of us than we might imagine. The apostles now have got to take and they've got to continue and do the same thing of what Jesus Christ had told them to do. Make disciples of men. Jesus is going to empower them by way of the Holy Spirit. And he says, and I can't put my spirit in you unless I leave. John chapter 14, it says that Jesus, are you going to leave? Yes, but I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm not going to leave you without a comforter. And this spirit, this Holy Spirit is going to not dwell on, dwell with you. It's going to dwell in you now that wherever you are, the Holy Spirit is going to be there. I'm going to be there to do the same thing of what I did in the flesh. To heal and to comfort people to restore hope amen and hold on church because I'm coming back turn to your neighbor and say neighbor he's coming back he's coming back he's coming back I, I, I wish I was there to hear exactly what Jesus is telling and I, I, I get a nosy at times like that because I wish I want to eavesdrop I want to know Jesus what what exactly are you telling them concerning the kingdom con kingdom that what he would tell them I, I wish I would have been there don't you I know some of y'all not as nosy as I am but I wanted to know Lord what 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 exactly are you saying not about church but about the kingdom and Jesus is not going to entertain them with discourses of politics. He's not going to talk about the kingdom of men. He's not going to talk about Donald Trump. He's going to talk about pure divinity and the kingdom of grace. He's going to talk about things that concerned him most. This would be his last moment, last opportunity to get them to become kingdom minded. Turn to neighbor and tell him, say, neighbor. We must be kingdom-minded. The difference between church-minded and kingdom-minded is church-mindedness church pertains only to what's happening inside the four walls of this building. And the reality is that the church isn't even the building. The church is us. The kingdom is what happens outside of the church building. And so we must be kingdom minded because a new dawn is upon us. Hallelujah. God's reign is getting ready to power and shower down upon us. Amen. And what will become of it depends on what these men do in response to what God through Jesus Christ had already commanded them. They had to have confidence now. Can you see it? No more Jesus. No crutch. Nobody to run to and say, Jesus, the, the, the Pharisees are after us. And Jesus said, I'll take care of it. No, there's no more Jesus now. He's gone. But now he lives inside of you. Mm. 
And he says, I want you to do the work so that way when you see the sick, you lay hands on them and they shall recover. These signs shall follow them that believe. Somebody say believe. believe. Come on, shout it out. Say, I believe. I believe. Because if you don't believe, hear me, beloved. If you don't believe in who he is and what he did on that cross, then I question the amount of power that you'll be able to walk in when you face your next challenge in crisis. The Bible says, amen, that in my name they shall cast out devils. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. In my name you'll be able to speak to mountains and the mountains will be removed. Do you believe that or not is going to be the question because if you believe then there is a responsibility that we all have to walk in and it's not just coming to church on Sunday morning. This deals with the reality, the harsh realities of the purpose of the church, the ecclesia of us gathering together. We're not here to just sing songs. We're not here to dress up for just Sunday mornings. We're here to hear the word of God concerning issues that pertain us most and what's really on God's heart. You want to know things pertaining to the kingdom? Come to church every Sunday morning and you'll hear what's on the heart of God. What's on the heart of God is I'm tired of seeing children neglected. That's what's on my heart. These things pertain to the kingdom of God. For Suffer not the children to come unto me. Why? Because such is the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. The one thing that God wants us to do is to not just, just to sing songs. And I love our praise team. Hear me, beloved. I love our praise team. But oh God, talk to me about things that are on your heart and help me to apply them in my life. Yes, I'm going to school. Yes, I'm doing this. And yes, I'm doing that. But God, if these things are not on your heart, then Lord, remove them, hallelujah, before I fail to respond to the call and the commission to go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all the things that you taught me while you were here. Mm. Jesus, the church is in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a quagmire. We're in a, in a precarious situation now. And as I said with Charles Dickens, um, he, was, he, was, he was kind of uh, phrasing in his, in his, in his great novel, um, Tale of Two Cities, it was dealing with the French and the British revolution that was taking place. And he starts out his great manuscript, these were the best of times and these were the worst of times at the same time. Why? Because if this revelation doesn't take place, nobody's going to get free. There's bloodshed running through the streets. These are the worst of times, but my God, these are also the best of times because when we get the victory over this, we will have the liberty to be what God has created us to be, amen. Hallelujah. They had to have confidence. Somebody say confidence. Confidence, amen, because it's one thing to hear what he says. Did you understand these things? Yea, Lord, I understand you lied. They don't understand all of these things, amen, but now... It's a matter of walking out what you have heard. They had to have confidence, amen. They had to be commissioned through the word of God, amen. And then there had to be a confirmation by way of the Holy Spirit. Confirmation. We need to know that the Holy Spirit is among us. Are you with me today? And the making of kingdom citizens is, not, is no easy task. Ask any pastor and they will tell you that in order to get your church to transform to be kingdom-minded, things pertaining to the kingdom, you have to change the mindset of the people. You got to change their language and you got to change their talk. You got to change. When you change their talk, you change the behavior. And when you change the behavior, you change the character. I'm going to say that again. In order to be kingdom-minded, you got to have a renewed mind. Hallelujah. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 12, it says, I beseech thee, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not, be not, verse 2 says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind that you may prove, prove, prove what is that good and acceptable will of God for us. 
I don't do this just for me. I do this for you. That you, Stephanie, might become a kingdom citizen so that way when you walk into your job, the kingdom is there. Why? Because you showed up. No wonder things change when you come into the room. No wonder things change when you speak over the situations. No wonder things happen when you apply your faith to what you believe. Good. I hope, ooh, I hope I'm in the right church today. The Bible tells us over in Romans chapter 14, it says, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but it is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that, he that in these things served Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. While Jesus would try to explain the kingdom, he would have to, while he was here, he had to use parables. He had to, why? Because the kingdom dynamics were so powerful and so profound that he would, he would try to say, oh, uh, okay, let me explain to you. Um, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who took everything that he had, took everything that he had, sold it so that way he could have one pearl. And for those of us who are church-minded or worldly-minded, we'll go, that makes absolutely no sense. I'm not doing that. But, ah, but the man who saw the pearl said, ah, this is worth everything. So I'm selling everything out. What he was trying to do is to tell us that what would it profit the man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? And so that would be way over our head, kind of like if I'm talking computers to Jeff or to one of the others that are in here, it's way over my head. I don't know what you're talking about. Break that thing into what Pastor Gwen calls the lowest common denominator. <laughs> Explain to us the kingdom, Lord. Okay, well, the kingdom of heaven is like, let me see, it's like a man, a man sowing seed into the field. And, and there were some that fell by the wayside, and some fell on stony ground, and some fell on good ground. What? 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 What are you talking about? Okay, the word of it's like this: a man <laughs> sows the word of God into the heart of people, and some people are their hearts are so stony and hard they can't receive the word of God. And the, and for some, their hearts are so their their their, their, their soil is 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 so narrow that they get excited, woohoo, hallelujah, about the word. But as soon as they walk out the church, the enemy comes in and steals that word right out of them. Why? Because they are not planted. Because there's care, y'all don't want to say amen to me, but because there are cares and issues of life that suck out the word of God. I can hear the word of God of faith while I'm in this building, amen, and while I'm in here. But as soon as I go out, the, the cares of this world kick in. It reminds me of my realities. So I have to just say, okay, Lord, I hear what you're saying, preacher. I hear what you're saying, pastor. That's good for you, but my reality is that I don't know if this is going to work. But my preaching to you and my sharing with you is not just for why we are in here. I want to make you a believer that when you go on your job, when you go in your classroom, when you face that next crisis situation, Tony, when you go and you face situations, I need you to be a believer right then and there. When you are in the hospital, when you're, where's Deacon Tuggles at? When they say your granddad has lost his life, you still got to be a believer. When they tell you that we don't know what's wrong with you, you still have to believe because I believe that if Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins, are y'all hearing me today? If he rose from the dead, I have to believe, I, I have to believe that if he can get up off of that cross and get up out of that grave, he can surely restore hope into me. He can restore my finances. He can rebuild a broken relationship. He can renew my faith in God. He can do what he said he can do. He will promise. He promised. He promised. And he says, wait for the promise. Turn to neighbors. Say, neighbor, wait for the promise. The promise is coming. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. The word of God. It's coming, saints of God. And it is not just for church and, and shouting. It's, re, it's for my realities that when I, sometimes I got to go into, I used to do it all the time. Hey Amen. And situations would be in my office. My God, I don't know how I'm going to get out of here. And I would go over to the bathroom. <laughs> That's my sanctuary. 
go to the bathroom, amen, shut the door, praise God, get down on hallelujah and go, God, I don't understand. I don't know how, how can all of this be happening, but yet I still believe in you. I'm sorry if this is not entertaining for you. I'm sorry that this is not going to make you shout. But what I have to do is present, hallelujah, the gospel to you to let you know that God is real. And we serve a mighty God, hallelujah, a God who can heal, a God who can forgive, a God who can restore. A God who can heal the brokenhearted, bind up their wounds. The chastisement of our peace is what I told you. It was upon him the things that you worry about. Y'all don't have to say amen to me, but there is something we worry about. We stay up late at night worrying, stressing over. God says, I've taken every last one of those cares and I've nailed them to the cross. Why? So that way you can have a peaceful sleep at night. Along with your sicknesses and disease, God took the chastisement of your peace. Bam! Nailed it to the cross. That one was for me. He had to ask him. And they asked him, Jesus, why do you teach us in parables? Because it is given unto you, Matthew chapter 13, over in verse 10 and 11. Why do you teach us in parables? Because it is given to you to know the kingdom, the mysteries of the kingdom. Find that verse, Yolanda, if you can. Over in Matthew chapter 13, I'm over in verse, hallelujah, I'm over in verse 10. Are you there? Why do you speak to us in parables? And he answered and said unto them, verse 11, because it is given unto you. Somebody say you. Point to neighbor and tell him, say neighbor. It's given to you. It's given to you. It's gi Jesus, it's given to you. It dropped in my spirit early this morning. It's given to you. Not for everybody, Tam. It's given to you. Why? Because we are in a kingdom place. Where a kingdom word from the king is given to kingdom citizens, and shh, this 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 is for you. Turn to this is for you. Shh, this is for you. It's like what I do with my. It's like what I do with my grandson Nick. I say, psh, Judy, come here, come here, come here. And what's what what? Pa? Here, I want to give you. Shh, this this for you. Don't tell anybody that I gave you a little something, something. You take this and you put this in your pocket. And all of a sudden, by the time I give it to him, he came to me one way. But by the time I what? Ever I have given him, he walks away a little bit different because now he's got something that he didn't have before. It's given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom, but to them, say to them, to them it is not given. Why? Because even if we gave it to them, they wouldn't understand because you have to have a renewed mind concerning these things pertaining to the kingdom. Life in the kingdom is a reality. It's returning back to the governance and the authority of God in the earth. Learning how to live above and not beneath. It's the same way that God said, I wanted you to live and be the, the Abrahamic covenant. I want you to be the blender and not the borrower. I want you to be the head and not the tail. I want you to be the one, amen, that people run to, not the one who's always running to people. That's kingdom living. Turn to your neighbor and tell him, say, neighbor, that's, that's kingdom living. When we, listen, we, when we are kingdom citizens, we, we, we can give and not have to expect anything back. Y'all don't want to say amen to that. We are the head. We're not the tail. Amen. We're not sitting in the back of the bus anymore. Come on, somebody. Amen. We're driving the bus. No, no, no. We're not driving the bus. We own the bus company now. That's kingdom living. Hallelujah. And the king's decree is unchangeable. So when God says it, that settles the matter. And Jesus came back to show them these things. He said, I want you to preach the gospel. I want you to be witnesses. Turn to neighbor and say, neighbor, 
Come on, look at a, no, look at a faith-filled neighbor and tell him, say, neighbor, we are the witnesses. We are the witnesses. We are the, we are the, are there any witnesses in here? Is there anybody who can testify, hallelujah, that you know that the Lord is good? You know that the Lord, see, we all are witnesses. Am I telling the truth about it? Is there anybody in here who knows God to be a healer? Listen, Mother Callum is here, hallelujah, where the doctor said this and that and this and that, hallelujah. I want you to see that I'm a witness to that she's in the house despite what doctors might say. I said despite what doctors said. Y'all don't want to say, man, y'all are so sedity. Y'all, y'all are so educated and so eloquent and, 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 and snooty. But I, hallelujah, was one of those that if the world, if, 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 if the world knew what I, how I was and what I did and how I did, oh God. But thank God he's a forgiver. Thank God he's a redeemer. Thank God he's the God of second, third, fourth. Y'all don't, I must be the only one in here who has been redeemed. I must be the only one in here who has been restored and forgiven. I must be the only one in here who knows, hallelujah, that God, or as the, as the scriptures say, can God? Yes, God can. There is nothing impossible. Am I, I'm a witness. There is nothing impossible with God. I'm a witness that all things are possible through God. Hallelujah. I'm a witness, hallelujah, of what it means to be healed and restored. I'm a witness of what it means to grow up in the projects and now I'm living in a deluxe apartment on the east side. I'm a witness, hallelujah, of what it is to have to get rid of a ghetto mentality and take on kingdom understanding that went beyond my ideals, but God brought me, thank God, he saved me one day. He saved, hallelujah, I said he saved me one day. He redeemed me another day. He filled me with the Holy Ghost another day. He empowered me with kingdom understanding so that I can't even look at life the same way anymore. I have to look at life through God's eyes. So no wonder I'm a little bit different. And our church going to be a little bit different. Are you hearing me today? I still believe he's a healer. Keisha, I still believe he's a healer. I still believe that he is a restorer. I still believe that God can forgive. I still believe. And, and, and it, is, it, is, it is until my last breath, honey. I'm telling you. I'm, t- I'm telling you. I'm telling you. To my last breath, I will continue to believe. Why? I have to believe because there are just some things in life I don't understand. Are y'all, underst- are y'all hearing me? I have to believe, Victoria, because there are some things in life I don't understand. And what I don't understand, I just have to believe. <laughs> I'm one of those crazy people that in the middle of the night watch stuff like National Geographic. And there was an episode, D, and it said, the origin of God. Ha, I gotta see that. What scientists in their right mind think that they have a understanding of God? So they go through and they're showing you all of this math and all of this science and all of this research and all of these satellite data and all of these awesome things that are way beyond my idea. And and, and I kept listening for the word um, uh, in theory, in theory, in theory. I said, well, where's the facts? If I'm going to believe, I need some facts. And then I turned to the Bible. Genesis 1, in the beginning, God. That's all I need to read. That's it. I don't need to read anything more. Why? Because I've realized that in spite of all of the facts, what I believe holds me to that cross. It is our purpose for the... 
It is our purpose for being here today. I'm not trying to make you laugh or, or, or to, or to in, uh, uh, impress you with my eloquent vocabulary or the essence of my effervescence of my personality. I'm just here to inspire you to believe. When you face a tough situation, are you hearing me today? When you face a situation that is seemingly hopeless, not that you've ever been there before. When you face a situation where you go, oh God, I don't know how all this is going to happen. I don't know how all this is going to unfold. I don't know where the answer, I don't know where the resources. God, the doctors are saying one thing. The bankers are saying another. And my God, I don't know what to do. But I'm just telling you that when you face those moments, when you face those moments, that's the time where I want this message to kick in. Mm. Hallelujah. And say, sir, I hear what you're saying, but yet I believe. It's the best of times. Come on, turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, these are the best of times and it's the worst of times. Let me go back. Acts chapter 1, Yolanda. They don't, they, don't, they don't sound convinced yet. Hallelujah. I'm here to convince you to be a believer. Any believers in here yet? I'm a believer. I'm a, I'm a believer. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because we can't even say, am I a Christian anymore? Because um, there are so many fabrications toward being a Christian that, I mean, you can be a Christian and still do the da 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 But if you're a believer then your actions are predicated by what you believe. Yeah. So I want to take you back there. Amen. The disciples don't know what they're going to do. Jesus tells them, okay, I'm leaving. I'm leaving. I'm leaving. And he goes up to them, amen. He tells them, I need you to go to wait in Jerusalem. And then in verse 10, Here's the dynamic. Are you with me so far? Somebody say amen. amen. It says, and while they were there, can you imagine them? The Bible says, and while they looked steadfast, well, verse 9, verse 9. And when he had spoken these things, while they, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him up out of their sight. Wow. And verse 10, and while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, he went up. And behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, verse 11, which also said, ye men of Galilee. Why, here's the question. Why stand ye here gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, here we go, shall also shall come in like manner as ye have seen him go up into heaven. Okay, so Jesus gives them the example. So I'm picking on Pastor Grant. Okay, here's what I need you to do. I'm giving you a commandment. I'm telling you what you need to do. I'm leaving, but I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm going to send the comforter to you. He's going to comfort you. He's going to fill you and empower you to do the things that I commanded you to do. Got it? Okay, so don't travel. Don't go all over and don't get distracted with all of these other things. I need you to go to, this, I need you to, go to church. <laughs> Uh-oh, hear that silence? <laughs> I need you to go to church for the next 40 days. Oh, come on, somebody. I, are there any old school Pentecostal folk in here who know what it's like to have revival and what it's like to go to church day in and day out and day in and day out? Y'all don't want to say amen to me? And I need you to go to church for 40 days, 50 days, every day, waiting for the promise. Come on, somebody. Waiting for what you here for? I'm waiting for the promise. I'm waiting for the promise. I'm waiting for the promise. Kind of like the only way that you all would be able to relate to this is if you did all of your Christmas shopping at the early part of December and all of those gifts are wrapped and nicely with bows and you have to wait for the promise on December 25th. You got to wait. You got to wait. Ah, don't you open those presents. That's for the time appointed. Mm, Hallelujah. You don't open the gift until the time appointed. Amen. And you got to wait. Oh, y'all don't want to say amen but if you had children like I had children those sneaky little rascals knew 
I, found, I figured it out. They knew how to manipulate with razor blades to slice open the tape. Y'all don't know. Y'all don't know, amen. Y'all did it yourselves, is that it? Amen. And you, and you took the, and you knew how to lay it right back so you can peek in to see what you have. But no, you got to wait for the promise. Pastor Gwen is the enforcer. Nobody opens the gift. Come on. What do we, we're waiting. And so JD, what they would do is wait till December 24th, 1159 and 30, 29. <laughs> 28, 20, 20, y'all get the picture. You wait for the promise. And now Jesus says, I'm leaving. And all of a sudden, a cloud comes. Can you imagine? A cloud, they're talking to him. And a cloud comes, envelops him, and takes him away. And they're like, Oh, my God. He's, hey, we're in West Texas. Never seen anything like that before. He's gone. Up in the clouds. Gone. Dissipated. Gone. Gone. You'll never see him like that again. Gone. While they're gazing, two angels pop up. You men in San Angelo. Christian House of Prayer. What, what are you looking at? Jesus, no, Jesus is not here. He's gone. This dynamic is a 21st century dynamic. Because many times in the churches, we can get so idle, Jackie, that we just sitting there looking. When's he coming? When he comes. What are we supposed to do? Well, we're just going to wait here. And the angel said, what are you doing? My word to the church is, what are you doing? Don't wait. Don't sit here idling, looking, wondering when and how. Get busy. Occupy till he comes back. Do what he told you to do when he was with you. Do what? Make witnesses and disciples and go tell everybody, go tell everybody, go tell everybody that Jesus is gone. Hallelujah. He's rose and now he's coming back. But while we're there, we've got a work to do. Turn to neighbor and say, neighbor, we've got a work to do. Come on, find, find, find somebody and tell them, say, neighbor, we got a work to do. We got a, we got a work to do. Find, no, y'all don't want to high five anybody. Okay, all right. I get it. We have a work to do. This same, here we go. This is eschatological in nature. This same Jesus, turn to neighbor and say, neighbor, this same Jesus, hallelujah, mm, when he is taken up from, which is taken up from you, so shall he come in like manner. Now that's a word for the whole church to remind everybody that he's coming back. Turn to neighbor and say, neighbor, He's coming back. On your job, watch this, on your job, you're going to find some uncircumcised heathen who cuss and lie and fuss and cuss. You can, and in your mind, you tell them, you need Jesus. And for some, for some, they will have to realize he's coming back soon. Are you hearing me? He's coming back soon. The message to the church today is that he's coming back soon. Well, Pastor, he's been gone 2017 years. I know, but he's sooner to return than he was before. Yeah. Everything from this moment forward is a latter day dynamic. Yeah. Amen. That's right. yeah. Are y'all okay? Yeah. Everything from this point on, from, it even marks, hey, your calendar even reflects BC and AD. After this point, Everything changes. Are y'all okay? I mean, everything B.C., before Christ. After Christ, A.D., everything changes. Wow. We have a whole new dynamic now because he's not with us to comfort us. The Holy Spirit now is in us to comfort us. Here, get to my point. 
In Luke chapter 14, Jesus, you praying for me, Pastor Gwen? You weren't there, but in our devotions a few weeks ago, last week as a matter of fact, we were dealing with something that huh, I had to stop and pray and think about, and then the more I, you ever hear something, read something, and then all of a sudden you get confirming witnesses from the north, south, east, and west. You get confirming witnesses from places and people who you did not even know and think about. And so we were in our devotion the other day, and we were reading something, but it had enough. And then this scripture popped in because she was, well, what do you think? And I said, I said, babe, it's reminding of this scripture that I just read. I'm over in Luke chapter 14, and I'm over in verse 16. Are you there? <sighs> Jesus. He said unto, and he said unto him, a great man made a great supper and begged many, asked many people to come. Are you with? And he sent his servants at supper time and said to them that were, that were bidden or invited, come, turn to neighbor and say, neighbor, come, come. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Come, for all things are now ready. Wow. And they all, with one consent, began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go to it and see it. Okay? I pray, have me excused. Another said, I have bought a five yoke of oxen. I pray, I must prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife. Well, he has no choice. He says, therefore, I, can, I cannot come. So that great servant came, assuming a servant came, and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, with his, said to his servants, go out into the streets. We got something to do. Go out into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in them hither, poor, maimed, halt, and blind. We've got something to do. Are you hearing me? Servant said, Lord, it is done. We went out and we did as you have commanded, yet there is still room. We still have a, a section right in here that still needs people to be filled in. Amen? And the Lord said unto the servant, go out into the highways and the hedges. Go under that bridge near McDonald's. All right? And compel them, compel them to come in that my house may be filled. What? See, in sonship, we teach about repentance from dead works. Where are those new sonship students at? Did Pastor Gwen teach you all repentance of dead works? And what's a dead work? A dead work is anything that causes a person to depart from the finished work of Jesus Christ. This could be seemingly good things. These good things have too many O's in it. They take a person's eyes off of the work at Calvary. And the high expectation of his return. It can be school. It can be pursuit of career. It could be engaging in sports. It could be music. You, you, you name it. It could be anything. But if it takes your eyes off of the finished work of Jesus... And his imminent return, it's a dead work. Yeah, I expected that silence. Because now it's getting closer to home. When I was in grad school, I realized that even though it was a worthwhile endeavor, I could not neglect God in what I was doing. Are you hearing me? When I went to work, even when I was in the military and I went to work, I still kept God as part of my opportunity to pursue excellence in everything that I did. When I worked in corporate America, I would pray over my staff and my supervisors to make sure that we had a harmonious balance and that they loved their manager. 
they would do, they would do anything for me. Hallelujah. Little do they know that before they showed up for work, I would go over to their church and bless them, Lord, with that attitude. Hallelujah. We bless them. We love them and let them know that there is a greater one down on the inside of them. But we refused, and I'm speaking for you and I, but we refused to pursue this and leave God on the background. When I go to church, when I go to take my exams, anybody know what I'm talking about? And I'm praying, Lord, I don't know the answer, but Holy Spirit, you do. And if you just speak to me, Holy Spirit, oh, Baba Shande K Bobo Show, speak to me, Lord. Especially in statistics. Oh, Lord, I need your hand, Lord, I need you. And God would bring things back to my remembrance. Am I the only one in here that can attest? Every relationship. When I pursued my wife, it had to be God in the relationship. Because pursuing a relationship without God leads me to an ungodly relationship. And I don't need any more drama in my life. Y'all don't want to say amen to me. When I'm trying to get my six pack, Tony, and I can't lift the weights, Lord Jesus, be the strength of my life. Have to. Because my life aspirations and my love toward God are inextricably linked. I can't pursue this and go, I'm not going to Bible study. I'm not going to church. I'm not going to give. I'm not going to serve because I've got this. And please, pastor, have me excused because I have. And see, and all of these are good things. Here, go back, go back. And what you'll see is that, man, he had, he had land that he bought. Are you with me? He had land that he bought. And these are seemingly prosperous things. I've got land that I bought. i got to prove this. I understand. Please have me excuse. And the Bible doesn't say, no, stay here. No, the Bible indicates, go. If that's, if that's where your passion is, go. The other verse says that I have bought five yoke of oxen, not two like common farmers, five yoke of oxen. That's 10 ox to plow your land. That's a prosperous opportunity go. If, 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 that's, if, if that's more important than doing the kingdom work, go. And the other one says, I've married a wife. Well, that's a whole life-changing situation, so go. One thing that I have to appreciate about my wife is that she has let me serve God and still be the husband. Are you hearing me? So that way I can, I can, my responsibility is to be a son to God, but be a husband to my wife. So that way she doesn't have to compete with God for my affections. I have made this determination and I've told her, I said, I love for 36 years. I have loved you, but you are a far and distant second to my love for God. What? Yeah. Because God says, I'll have no other gods before me. I'm not going to compete with you for anything. So if you love her then more than you love me, then go ahead and love her. If video games occupies your time, that's where your heart is. So don't get distracted or don't get dis- disappointed when God doesn't show up every time you cry out unto him. I'm, I have an excuse. God is in these days saying, you know what? No more excuses, saints. Are you hearing me today? Here, I'm going to give you this last one, and then I'm going to let you go. Y'all are getting, y'all are getting upset with me. I can, I can feel it. Somebody shout Jesus in the house. Jesus. Hallelujah. I feel that. Praise God. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, and then I'm going to leave you alone. Amen. Chapter 4. 
just going to borrow just five minutes of your time. Can I do that? We'll still have time for the restaurants. <laughs> Amen. We still have time for restaurants. First Timothy chapter 4. Are you there? And in verse 1, it says, Now, the Spirit speaketh expressly, even there. The Spirit speaks expressly. In other words, I'm trying to make this very, 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 very clear to all of you. That in the latter days, somebody say latter times, there shall, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. What? That in the latter days, and how many of you know we're in the latter days? Our commission in these latter days is to have the same spirit of God, but somehow or another, Paul writes to Timothy that I'm speaking express here. See, can you find this in the message version? And, and let's, let's have a little fun with the more contemporary vernacular. Let's see. The spirit, there it is. The spirit makes it clear that as time goes on, some are going to give up on the faith and chase after demonic illusions put forth by professional liars. Go back to King James. They didn't like that either. Expressly that in the latter days, some shall depart from the faith. I believe, um, where my sonship students at, amen? Um, did Pastor Gwen teach you all about syntax yet? She did? Not yet? Because y'all are still uh, Gilgal. Okay, not yet. Okay. So, so I believe that, that the, 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 the syntax of it is, is in the right order. In other words, in the latter days, some thou shalt depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devil. You would think that the seducing spirits would come first and then cause people to depart from the faith. But Paul doesn't write it like that. Paul writes it and says that some have departed from the faith and then the seducing spirits kick in. Everybody see that? There's a unique dynamic that takes place because go back. I'm not going to deviate from that verse right there. We're going to park right here. When the seduction takes place, I was talking to a young man and he was so intrigued with the... Um, NFL um, draft. His hope was that this young 20-year-old was going to change the whole dynamic of the impending team. And he's excited over the fact that one kid who has yet to be proven is going to be paid a whole lot of money with the hope and the expectation that he was going to bring this team to beat the New England Patriots? Are you kidding me? Come on, really? Really? And I listened. To, I listened. And his heart and his passion was that everything, I don't know what's going on. Hallelujah. Boy, that devil is mad, ain't he? Is that it? I could not get him to talk about faith. I could not get him to talk about God. And I'm trying to throw nuggets in there like, you know, but the Lord. Is like, but you know what they did? They, they, they paid him a lot of money. And I think that this kid, man, he runs a 4, a, 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 a 440, a 4.6 and 40, 40 yards and 4. I, I could care less. And he weighs 235 pounds. He put on 200 pounds, 20 pounds of muscle. I could care less. Why? Because my eyes are here. And, and what happens is when he departs from the faith, in other words, when you lose and you stop praying, saints of God, I got to close. But when you stop praying, when you stop coming to intercessory prayer, when you stop coming to Bible study, when you stop coming to church, when you stop serving, when you stop, your faith is going further and further and further away. Watch this dynamic. And that's when the seducing spirits kick in and draw your heart further away. 
It's a very real dynamic. And so in order to get people to come, we got to entertain. We got to get that praise hype. Woo, come on, Nally. Bring the heat. Bring the fire. Bring the dance. Bring the shout. Hallelujah. Let there be light shows and laser shows in the church. Y'all don't want to say amen to that. Take the cross down. Put imagery up there and, and make the place dark it's like a club so that everybody can dance and nobody can see me dance. Amen. And I say to that, not in this house. What we do, we'll do in the light. Are you hearing me today? And I have concluded I am not going to be seduced. I'm not going to leave. Forgive me, Lord, for every time I have missed prayer or missed Bible study, and I really didn't have a reason not to be there. Uh, I don't want to go. You know my team is coming on. And why did they put Empire on on Wednesday nights? Don't they know? <laughs> Pastor changed Bible study to Thursday so that I can watch Empire on Wednesday. But no, I can't because Scandal comes on on Thursday and you know we got to watch. We got to watch Scandal. I mean, we, we have to see what Olivia Pope is going to do. Certainly that's more important than what God has to say. Go ahead and laugh. Hallelujah. We got to preach holiness. We got to be holy. Why? Because God is holy. We got to tell people about salvation. Are you hearing me today? We got we to gotta make sure that we don't, take, we don't give in to the seducing spirits. One time it, ripped, it, it tore me up because God was calling me to a prayer and to meditate on his word at a moment when one of my favorite teams was on TV. That's warfare. Y'all going to have to say amen, but that was warfare. In my mind, I would love to pray hallelujah, but please, Lord, let Kawhi score 22, Lord Jesus. Bless him, Lord. Bless him. You're talking to God about Kawhi Leonard. <laughs> really? I'm, can I, am I being too transparent? Are y'all okay? And I said, with that, Lord, I really need to embrace you. In the name of Jesus. Church, let's not allow these things to take place. Let's follow the great commission of what he has declared for us to be righteous in our unrighteous world, to be salt and light. Are you hearing me today? To be salt and light in this, and have the distinction to care about things that are outside of our own realm here in these four walls and to care for those who are outside. Amen. And so I pray, I pray for you, church, that you would, let he who have an ear, let him hear what the Spirit of God is saying to the church. He's talking to each one of us, your fulfilled purpose, your God. He didn't save you by accident. He saved you because he has a purpose and an assignment for your life.